Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Well, thank you for coming. I'd like to introduce Mark Millstone. He is visiting us from Courant Institute and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Thank you very much. First, thank you all for coming. And I want to say this is joint work with my advisor at Courant, Michael Overton, and then Juan Meza and Chao Yang at Berkeley National Lab. So first, let's explain what the problem. This is a very different style of problem. We're basically working on dev developing an algorithm for one objective function. We have one problem in the world. We're trying to exploit properties of this function. So I need to at least explain to you why this problem is important. So 1830, Sir August Comte. Every attempt to employ mathematical methods in the study of chemical questions must be considered profoundly irrational and contrary to the spirit of chemistry. And then later he goes on to say that this would result in widespread generalization, degeneration of that science. 1830, math does not have anything to do with chemistry. Now let's look about 10 years ago. There are plenty more quotes like this. But now, computational methods nowadays mainly supplement experimentally attained information. They are soon expected to increasingly supersede this information. We want to give a molecule. We want to start computing solutions to this in the, on the computer first. It's hard to build large molecules. It's hard to do experiments with many different types of large molecules. So if you use computers to give you a rough, rough idea of the solution first, you can then really really understand what's going on in the lab later on. So in this vein, science and computation are very closely linked to one another. Um, scientists want to understand bigger and bigger problems. And computer scientists in the past are trying to write algorithms that can scale more and more. But I think right now, the scientists are winning. They want to look at larger problems than we can actually compute solutions for. For example, cadmium selenide is the critical component of making fuel cells and solar cells would have a problem, be it 1,000 to 5,000 electrons. Solar cells in general, maybe we can model an entire solar cell. The molecules representing solar cells would be on the order of 50,000 electrons. And we can look at integrated circuits. And these are on the order of a, thousand, a million electrons. We want to understand really big problems and predict their properties on the computer. So in some ways, mathematically, this problem solved. It's solved by the Schrodinger equation. Here's the mini-body problem. I'll come over here so I can actually see. So this is the mini-body Schrodinger equation. I'm putting it up just to understand what's going on. We have H is a Hamiltonian, and psi here is a mini-body wave equation. Um, well, we're not going to need this that much, but this sort of give you a flavor of the problems we're dealing with. We have a Hamiltonian as a product of sum of some number of Laplacians. I always mean delta to be a Laplacian. Some potential due to the nucleus, the neutrons here, R hat J. And then some potential due to the electron-electron interaction. There's three terms here. And if we were to solve this, this is an eigenvalue problem. We could solve it. Um, psi would contain all the information of the system. Any property given by the system can get, is, is given by psi. The norm of psi squared gives a probability density. What do we mean here? Well, psi here, what's the probability of finding an electron 1 near a small space near R1? and the probability of finding a small electron, R2, near a small area around R2. It gives you this probability. We're to always talking in terms of probability with these problems. And lambda here, the eigenvector, represents the energy. So our, we're not really done yet, though. I mean, we wish we could be done, because this really theoretically explains everything. However, if we were to discretize this on a 32 by 32 by 32 grid, and just for five electrons, the Hamiltonian would have a dimension over 3.5 times 10 to the 22nd. Clearly not doable. So how are we going to start solving this problem? And again, the problem is we want to predict the reactions of molecules and the behavior of molecules and many different properties computationally. So the cone sham equations is one such approach to these problems. Um, there's another approach called Hartree-Fock. It's a different idea. It's a different type of approximation. Cone-sham equations are what we care about. So let's give some history. 1964, Hohenberg and Cohn gave a purely theoretical mathematical result. They said that at ground state, meaning at the minimum energy level, 
the total energy of the function is a function not of this midi body wave equation, but of what's called the charge density. Now observe in their original proof, the charge density is defined in terms of the midi body equation. So it doesn't really help us. It's purely theoretical. But the difference now is that the, char um, the wave equation here says, what's the probability of finding electron 1 near R1, electron 2 near R2, et cetera? The charge density is, what's the probability of finding any electron near a small space near R? We give up on knowing which electron it is. All we care about is that there is a electron nearby. What's that probability? So we're sort of letting, we're treating it all as a mass. We're not really caring which one it is anymore. And from this, they show that if you know the charge density at ground state, you can drive all the other properties of the molecule. You can drive the force due to the movement. You can drive the mag, um, magnetic forces. All these different properties you can drive from the charge density at ground state. I should add that this only applies at the minimum energy. Away from the minimum energy, this charge density doesn't match up at all. So now we have a theoretical basis for what we're doing. A year later, Cohn and Sham, and Cohn won the Nobel Prize for this in the 1990s, proposed a practical formulation, and that uses NE, single particle orthogonal wave functions, psi. Okay? And these do not interact. The problem with the multi mini body problem is that the electrons interact with one another. So these do not interact. And what they determine is that the electron electron interactions are modeled by what's called the exchange correlation energy. This is basically a term they prove exists in theory, but moreover, they go one step further. They give an equation which matches experiment. So all the magic happens in this exchange correlation energy term. And this models the electron-electron interactions. Another important thing to note here is that I'm going to call these wave functions. And you're going to think they really correspond to a real, something re truly physically meaningful. In fact, they don't. These are entirely artificial constructs. All that matters is the charge density here. The charge density will match up at the minimum energy level. The wave functions have no physical meaning. And material scientists and chemists have given these some sort of meaningful terms to think about it, but they're not real, they're totally artificial constructed um, wave functions. They don't correspond to a single electron or anything like that. So let's go over these um, equations. So now we're assuming the psi i's are orthogonal. So the charge density now is given from the sum to one any of the inner products of the psi i. Okay, and what we do also know is that we take the probability, the one norm of this, this always equals the number of electrons. The ex now this is where the magic happens. It's called the exchange correlation energy. It's given the integral of this charge density, which we'll see often, rho, times this magical term. And there's many different approximations here. But the key thing is that we can compute this analytically. It depends only on the charge density, not on the wave functions themselves. And um, we can compute it efficiently. And more, moreover, this value really does match experiment closely. And so finally, I'm going to show this equation multiple times and explain it multiple different times. They give us code the cone sham energy. We have three terms here. The first is what's called the kinetic energy. It's, um, the wave functions inner product with a Laplacian. We have the energy due to the um, ions, so the neutrons. So V ion is a function of location only. It's a fixed variable. It's determined by the molecule and we can only care about. And then finally, we have what's called the Hartree energy, which this sort of tells how does a charge, charge density at one point interact with the charge density at another point in space. But again, we only care about charge densities here. We don't care about the wave functions themselves. And then finally, we have this exchange correlation energy. So there's four terms here. And what we can group, we generally group these two together because they're local interactions. Laplacian is, by definition, a very local operator. Nearby grid points only deal with nearby grid points. The um, V ion potential only deals with electrons which are nearby. And these are more of the global properties. Like this is where areas in space interact with areas much further away from them. And so now, how we compose this problem? We want to minimize the cone chain energy such to orthogonality constraints. And this is really the problem. Now, how do we solve this? So one way is write down the work with the KKT conditions. You write down the Lagrange, we take the derivatives. And now, HKS is the, what I call the cone sham Hamiltonian. And I'll write it different ways depending on the context I need. But it's the Laplacian plus a term that's the potential for the ionic energy, 
plus this is a convolution which represents that heart tree energy I pointed out, and this is the derivative of the exchange correlation. So I'll often just lump them all together as you have a little plus and plus a potential. Observe that this is only a function of rho. So now a rho is a function of psi. Rho equals the summation of psi i times psi j. So we can solve this as a non or sorry, as a nonlinear eigenvector problem. In fact, that's how we'll talk about this later. That's how most people solve this. We work direct with the KKT conditions. We, um, I'll go through this again, but this is a nonlinear eigenvector problem, which is very different than the standard nonlinear eigenvalue problems you see. So I'll come back to this like, multiple times. And please interrupt me if you have any questions. Um, a generalization, which I'm going to work with. So in the previous slide, I said everything's orthogonal. What if we want to remove this orthogonality constraint? Well, we deal with it through an overlap matrix. We build a big matrix such that the jth k element is just the inner product of the psi j and psi k. The charge density gets multiplied through by the S inverse term. So the rho changes a little bit. And now the energy changes a little bit as the rows change here. And we multiply an extra S inverse in the front of the kinetic energy. Now this is much more complicated than the previous equations. Why would we do it? Well, it has a very special property now. And I'll, you'll see this more when I discretize, and I'll explain it again. Given two sets of vectors that span the same space, the energy is constant. That means it's not the actual basis vectors themselves we care about. We only care about the span of the basis vectors. So this is, and this is the key property here. This is why we're going to do this. This will allow us to exploit properties of this function to allow better scaling algorithms. So now we want to discretize and optimize. We have to discretize the problems, and we're going to run an optimization algorithm. How are we going to, so let's talk about how we're going to do that. Okay. Slow down a little bit. First step, we have to choose a discretization. So what's standardly used, at least in the material science community and the chemistry community, is called plane waves. Basically, every psi at different, you know, at grid points is equal to the summation of exponentials. This is a very physically realistic, it's naturally orthogonal. It allows a, if you want a finer grid, you just have to take more elements in this sum. And you can really, you can get the best approximation you want because of this Nyquist frequency. You know exactly how many terms to take for a given resolution. So this is one way of doing it. And the advantage is also is that so you can just increase resolution. Um, this convolution, well, this is basically it could become a matrix multiplication D and FFT. Because this is in some way just a Fourier transform. So this convolution becomes very easy. But the disadvantage here is that these sides are inherently non-local. These exponentials span the entire space you care about. And remember, I've already mentioned the word locality, and I'll define this later. But we really want a representation such that nearby grid points only depend on nearby grid points. Because Laplacian here will be, will be dense. Another approach is the finite difference approach. Here, this is just a 1D, of course, but a given element of the derivative system, the standard finite difference approximation. So the advantage here is that the Laplacian is well known, what it looks like, out to multiple orders. It's highly localized, and everything's very sparse. The disadvantage here is that we're, this convolution is going to require a solution to a Poisson problem now. So we're going to have to use an iterative algorithm to solve this convolution. But that's fine. We know how to do that. So we're really going to focus on the finite difference approach. So now let's talk about the discretized problems. Here is the problem discretized in the finite difference problem. X here is a long and skinny vector. N is the number of grid points. N E is the number of electrons we care about. And again, I'm saying electrons, but I don't really mean electrons. I mean these imaginary things that were invented for the cone sham problem. So the first term is the energy due to the kinetic and ionic term. Well, it's a x star x s inverse times x star times the Laplacian plus the ionic potential. The Laplacian here is highly sparse. You generally take up to about an eighth order Laplacian approximation. So it's not just the one negative one, two, negative one. It's a little more than that, but it's still sparse. V ion is governed by the molecule in question, and it's actually just a diagonal matrix. So this is the local components. The Hartree energy 
becomes row transposed L pseudo inverse row. This is where you simplify. What we actually mean is we're solving the Poisson problem here to get this term. And finally, the exchange correlation energy is this row transpose time this thing that we know exists and they give us a good value for. So this is our energy. It's very big, it's very compu computationally heavy. We're talking grid points on the order of hundreds of thousands. And we want to scale this to hundreds of thousands of electrons. So we're going to have to exploit sparsity. And I want to point out again, so these are the local terms, the kinetic ionic, so I group them together. And these are the non-local terms. And the row here, this isn't how you actually compute it, but you can just represent easily just the diagonal of this matrix here. So are there any questions? So I see where the game the equation sort of starting to make sense. So this is the only equation we care about. Okay. So I'm going to give a, um, oh, sorry, one more thing. So what I said prior in the non-discretized version, the continuous version, everything only depends on the um, basis, on the span of the basis, not the basis itself. Well, you can do the calculation here, and you see that this energy, for any invertible matrix G, invertible, not orthonormal, any invertible matrix G, E of X times G equals E of X. So let's just talk about it for a second. I'll, so the row term is easy. Everything cancels out. You can trust me on it, but you get um, G transpose, X transpose, X, G, inverse. You flip them, and then they cancel out here and there. And this term, you get the middle stuff cancels, cancels out, and you get trace of... Um, G inverse something, 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 X times G. And the trace is invariant under unitary, or sorry, similarity transformations. So row is the same, just defi by computation, everything cancels. And the trace is the same because of similarity transforms. So now we have some equations of how we understand this very unique property of this function. And, and just for understanding this a little better, let's look at a simplified version. And my law, my code, the first part of my code example would be based on this problem right here. We have a discretized Laplacian. Again, the signs don't really matter. For my, for, it's a model problem. I, have, I don't need any physical, real, I don't have to match experiment. So let's just go to the negative sign. And we have a term for the potential here, a diagonal matrix. And we have the Hartree energy. I've gotten rid of the exchange correlation for now. And this is what I call the model problem. And I was curious, does, does this first term look familiar to anybody? This ignore the second term. Does the first term look familiar? Well, linear algebra 101, the Rayleigh quotient is x transpose ax over x transpose x. If we minimize this, we know that we minimize this. This goes to the smallest eigenvalue of a, and x is the eigenvector. We can generalize this. I blank on the name of the I think it's the chi fan theorem. So this converges. If x has k columns, the minimum value of this is the sum of the first k eigenvalues. And it gives you a minimizer that spans the space of the first k eigenvectors. So we're now optimizing an eigenvalue problem. And so this is a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. I said that again. So this is very similar. This is just the generalized Rayleigh quotient. So now we have to compute a solution. This is really where we can start interesting stuff. So the current way, the state of the art way, I th think that accounted for something like 75% of all time on the NERSC computers last year was a variation of this algorithm. It's called the self-consistent field iteration. This problem deals with the KKK Susan directly. It tries to solve the nonlinear eigenvector problem. Another approach, which is actually more recent, is to try to minimize energy directly, either the constrained version with the orthogonality constraints or the non-constrained version without, with the extra inverse of the front. So let's talk about SCF first, because that is what people use now. It's actually very simple. It's a fixed point iteration. We evaluate the Hamiltonian at a given row. So this is fixed matrix. We solve a linear eigenvalue problem, get the energy, compute the new row. And by definition, we're calling an eigenvector problem. So they're automatically orthogonal. So by, you inherit the orthogonality by definition. So we solve an eigenvector problem, compute a new row, compute the new potential. Now we have a new Hamiltonian, so we solve it again. We just do this over and over again. So we solve a sequence of linear eigenvalue problems. And this is what is mostly state of the art. So what's the scaling here? O of n cubed. The, you have to compute the eigenvector problem. It's orthogonal. So it's cubic work, the number of electrons. Um, the convergence is slow. It's not monotonic. In fact, it doesn't have to converge at all. 
Um, you can give two by two matrices, which it diverges to two limit points, such that neither limit point is a solution to the problem. And um, it's, again, it's the energy, we're minimizing a KT solution. Energy can fluctuate crazily up and down. And at least as an optimization person, I don't like that. I like sequential decrease in energy. And there are a lot of heuristics to make this go faster. It's called charge mixing. The idea is things like, oh, look, we just averaged the previous iterates. And it makes it go faster. This is, so this is, this is data that knows it's inherently orthogonal. And if we're much from linear algebra, if things are orthogonal, you're inherently stuck with O of n cubed um, scaling. You have to do at least some form of Grand Schmidt or something. So let's talk about CG, um, nonlinear conjugate gradients. I use Fletcher Reeves not because it's my favorite algorithm, but just because what the field uses. And for comparison points, all the other algorithms use CG, Fletcher Reeves, although it's known to converge slowly in some instances compared to Pollock Rivier and other variations. So again, what do we need here? We have to compute a gradient. Search direction, we have to do a line search. Remember, CG requires a very specific line search. It has to meet the strong wolf conditions with a very small constant. It has to be less than a half. And then we just, this, this is a very standard up algorithm. And you'll see it multiple times, because so we're going to modify this algorithm. We're going to add to it. And so I think the paper, the first used CG to the cone sham problem, I think was in the 90s. So it's rather recent to even consider it's possible to minimize energy. Okay. So I've said this word a lot, locality. Locality, sparsity, what does that mean? We want to design things that are scale. I've already said the Laplacian finite differences is very sparse. The potentials are sparse. So nature is actually pretty nice to us. And the easy way to say it is nearby things only interact with nearby things. As you get further and further apart, you can prove actually theoretically that for an insulator, as you get further and further apart from away from each other, it actually decays exponentially in the interaction. So you don't have to be very far away to have basically negligible interaction between the two. For a conductor, it's a little worse. It decays algebraically, but it still decays. So how can we take advantage of this fact? And the hope is that by having locality and exploiting locality, we can have a sparse matrix X. If we're evaluating energy as sparse matrix X, we can really get some scaling and scalability here. So let me show you two equal solutions. You can trust me that the objective function is equal. Okay? We have an orthogonal solution. Um, this is for five electrons in the model problem, just a grid size of... There's 100 grid points, very small. This solution is orthogonal, and this one's localized. This one, if you notice, every column of X, this is the columns of that matrix, X matrix, only has finite support on 30 out of 100 elements. So if we're evaluating at an iterate, these both have the same energies, we would much rather evaluate an energy that looks like this. Every column of X only has finite support. This, oops, sorry, things are going crazy here. Apologize. Okay, so let's look at this again. So here, if we evaluate this energy, the model problem. Really, they're structurally the same except for one extra term. But we want to evaluate x at columns such that every column in x has a sparse structure and it's exploitable. We know exactly where the sparsity is. So basically, we want to evaluate columns of x that look like this and not like this. And we want to optimize in such a way that we always maintain the sparsity. We always want to evaluate x at this language. And note in this type of format. And so how do we do that? First of all, we, can, we can't do it with orthogonal um, wave functions. The only really sparse orthogonal wave functions is the multiples of the identity. I mean, to be orthogonal, you, it may be like you know, non-zero in a small area and zero everywhere else, and that just doesn't overlap. So to have this locality, this sparseness, we have to have norm orthogonally. It's definitely necessary. So now the question is, is that we have a sparse iterate. We want to optimize, take steps. We always want to maintain sparse. We always want to evaluate our energy in a sparse iterate. But meanwhile, we said we have this extra fact. This isn't, an op this isn't a general random problem. It's a very specific energy problem. So the idea is that we want to find every step a sparse basis that has a nice form that's very close to the dense basis. So let's just talk about how we can do this. So as I said already, you have an iterative algorithm. You have a sparse iterate. You take a step. There's no reason to think a priori that that step, the next iterate is going to be sparse. 
I mean, if you do steepest ascent, just because e of x, x is sparse, the gradient's going to be dense. Okay. So here's a naive approach. Take a step, just truncate. So just to give some notation, anywhere you see a tilde, that means it's a sparse matrix and it's exploitably sparse. I know exactly where the non-zero elements are. Um, and x, this sub t here means, that was that sparse spy I gave you. That means you truncate everywhere outside of that region to zero. Okay? So my approach is just to truncate. Well, this is a bad idea, and people did it for a long time, not really knowing what's a bad idea, but they observed the following. Um, you got stuck in local minimum. They weren't the real answer. You got stuck in local minimum, weren't the real, lo the real problem. And that's actually pretty easy to see. Um, let's look at this picture here. This is actually a simple two-dimensional quadratic, and the diagonal is x transpose ax, and a has just a diagonal matrix with one and negative one on the um, diagonal. So clearly minimizing this, the minimum is, negative, is a negative infinity. Take the component corresponding to the negative one and send it to infinity. So the minimum here is negative one. But if you were to truncate the second component of the vector, x transpose ax, the second transpose of x, you get a whole slew of local minimum at zero, which is, doesn't correspond to the real problem at all. So it was observed for a long time that truncation doesn't work. At least you don't get the answer you care about. So we on E and Gao um, last year came with the idea of let's minimize the truncation error. I'll explain what this means. We're, and they call this localization. So remember, E of x, g, times E of x is invertible. Or for any invertible g, the energy is the same. So let's compute a g such that the area off the support is minimized. We're going to rotate the, all the columns of the matrix, truncate, and find the g that minimizes that truncation error. Now, depending, all you need is g is invertible. And to be honest, this is actually a really easy problem to solve. Um, I didn't write down how to do it. But if you just assume, A, you can compute G column by column. And if you assume that, they say, the columns of G sum to 1, this is just a least squares problem. It's pretty straightforward to do. So it's just a simple least squares problem. And so the idea, idea, idea is, give me this picture. We're at a dense center at xk. So the energy is the same on this entire coset of vectors here, values, because it's independent. So let's find the one which is closest to the sparse trum space, subspace, truncate. And hopefully the energy stay about the same. I say hopefully. They're going to change a little bit. They're going to have to. Okay. So this is this is what they came up with, and they then integrated this idea into um, Fletcher Reeves, and they called it CGL. So let's see how it's different. This is exactly the same. Now, um, this may, the integer may or may not be sparse. It might localize the first one. It depends what they want to do. So they first choose a line search. They take the dense step. This is xk plus 1 is a dense matrix. They localize, then they truncate. And they also have to modify the search direction down here because you've rotated the whole space, so you have to pre rotate the previous search direction as well. And then they truncate this. And so what they said, this is the problem they're trying to solve. They want to make sure we do no longer get stuck in local minimum. Truncation gets stuck in local minimum. There aren't the real answer. Let's avoid that. So this is my code, not theirs. I implement all their ideas. And we ran this from, um, I'm sorry, oh, sorry, a small problem. 100 good points, 5 electrons. I ran it from 50 random starting points. Completely random. And I ran, them to, I ran the solutions to completion. So it's a given tolerance. And the circles are the localized E of Gauss algorithm. And the x's are just truncation. So look, x, actually, on this one, 100% of them avoided local minimum. Whereas truncation did get stuck away. So why aren't we done? This is sort of my starting off point. Well, let's look at this. So x tilde is sparse. What's p here? Where do we actually evaluate the energy? We evaluate the energy in a line search. The search direction is dense. Because the search direction equals the gradient, which is the residual, plus something which is sparse. So yes, every iterate x is sparse. right? But when we evaluate it, it's still evaluating a dense problem. So yes, we do avoid local minimum, but we're still not getting any of our scalability yet. So that's the first issue I have. The second is that we, the energy is not, isn't monotonic anymore. When we finish right here, we've now localized x. So energy right here need not be the same as energy here. It need not be monotonic. And again, I'm an optimization person. I like energy, the objective function, to decay monotonically. That's the whole point, I think, for this type of problem. So, but this is a good idea. We now avoid local minimum. 
So now, this is my plan. I'm going to develop an algorithm that first maintains the property of avoiding a local minimum. That is important. We're going to run this. When we finish, we want to make sure we have an answer that we can trust. And B, we want to evaluate the energy only at sparse iterates in the line search. So we have to make sure our search direction is sparse. So now I hope you understand the game we're going to play. We have this really nice function. It has some interesting properties. It depends only on the span of the basis. And now we have to develop an algorithm excuse me, to satisfy these properties. So basically we're now, here's my algorithm. I'll show you how it works now. And this took a long time to come up with works, but this is where it comes down to. Let's assume our initial iterate is sparse, okay? Very simple picture. We compute a dense search direction, PK. Whatever algorithm you want, actually. I integrate this for my testing purposes with conjugate gradients, but you can generate any way you want, okay? Now we take the full Cauchy step, take a full step in that direction, and localize this matrix. You localize the Cauchy step and make that sparse. So we now have a dense step here, and now we truncate and localize and truncate through the G, which minimizes the truncation error. And now we define as our search direction in this sparse subspace, the difference between this sparse matrix and this sparse matrix. Now I have a lot of things I have to justify first. Do I maintain descent? I mean, a priori, there's no reason to think I maintain descent. Actually, I'll tell you, theoretically, I don't. But I will also say the experiment shows it maintains descent most of the time, and that's good enough. Okay? So let's talk about how we integrate this. And now, again, I want to iterate, reiterate the fact that PK can be any optimization algorithm. We're no longer stuck. With Ian Gallup method, it was not very clear how to integrate limb memory BFGS with this localization framework, because you have to muck with the previous search directions. It wasn't, it's not clear, at least to me, a priori how to integrate this. And I want to be able to say, well, look, give me your algorithm, give me your search direction, let's make it sparser. Okay. So here's the algorithm. So again, it's very crucial now, the initial iterate is sparse. Maybe you do one step of the localization that they just mentioned, but the initial iterate is sparse. You have a general initial search direction. So you compute the G, which minimizes this new uh, localization error. And now you just change the search direction, P tilde K, equals you know, the difference between the two. Now we do a line search. Now the, notice the difference here is that A, PK is a descent direction, hopefully. So energy will automatically be monotonic if it maintains descent. And B, we're always evaluating energy at X tilde plus P tilde. It's always sparse. Always, always sparse. And then this is just, nothing else changes down here. This is just vanilla conjugate gradients. So really I inserted three lines in between the algorithm. So the first question you ask is, does it work? Um, well, this is a much harder problem. I made it be that the, um, so I said there's local and non-local terms, okay? And I made the non-local terms be much more, much larger. So it really does affect the problem more. And we already know, this is again all my code, and we already know that on the easy problems you can solve it. And actually this problem is even harder than real problems. So the circle is me and the X is Ian Gal. So look, we do a pretty good job of minimizing um, avoiding local minimum, and the arrows here point to places where not only did we do as well as Ian Gal's CGL, we did better. These are starting points such that we did not get stuck in the local minimum and they did. Okay, so and then, again, this is a much harder problem. We're going to talk about the real problem a little bit larger later. So not only do we do as well, we do better. And these are all from random starting points. I really just type in random a matrix, localize it in both. But this is even more important. I ran our algorithm for a long time. I just let it go until a very tight convergence to see what would happen. The blue is ours, and this is the log of the error at every iterate minus the actual true solution. This is the number of iterations. The blue is our argument. So notice we do maintain this monotonic decrease of energy. We're always getting better. And the Ying algorithm does jump around a lot. And it's even more prevalent in other problems. So again, localization, so now we do better. We maintain mon monotonicity. Okay. Um, so we're going to quickly, but let's talk about a real problem. So I'm um, first going to say, this is not the type of problem this algorithm my room is meant for. This is actually a very simple problem. And this algorithm is meant for problems where are chains of these things. So right now, so this is methane. There's one carbon, four hydrogens. And you already know the solution a priori is going to be, the orbital will be centered around the atoms. 
that, that's sort of, you, you're, you can always imagine that, you know, the interactions happen among the atoms. Imagine chains of these things together, 100 of them. So the interactions don't just happen near the atoms, they also happen away from the atoms, like at the bonds where atoms meet. So in some ways, this is like one of the worst problems. A simple problem like this is actually one of the worst problems of this type of method. Okay, and this, so this has eight electrons and four orbitals. It's very small. Um, for this problem, I just discretized uh, 16 steps in each direction. So the Hamiltonian is only 4,096 by 4,096 because I'm doing it on my laptop in MATLAB and I'm in the process of writing real code that scales. And I know the solution from another tool is 120 Rydbergs. It's a known solution. Okay? And so again, I want to point out, this is really the worst case for this type of algorithm because ortho the interactions are very localized already as it is. Okay. So now let's talk how we can solve it. I, um, so firstly, chemists have much better ways of choosing localization regions. They really come from the molecules themselves. They really understand how this works. Um, I chose this arbitrarily because I'm not a chemist. And there's a lot of black magic in how to choose these localization regions, which is very important. So I just chose, um, I think, 1,500 non-zeros per column. And I put them with no relationship to the atoms. You generally would center them on the atoms or something like that. I just chose them, honestly, almost arbitrarily. And now I also so I start from a random point. I think it was cheating. If I say avoid local minimum, then I give it a very good local starting point. I think that's cheating. But that is what's nearly done. You generally have a really good initial guess for how, where to start this, okay? And now this is plot the iterates. So first let's talk about converge to. I converge to an energy which is not as good as the true solution. 127 Rybergs, that's about 5%. 7 over 120. But, let's talk about the iterates here. By 20 iterates, again, I'm, I'm not doing orthogonalization. This is, the only work here is computing the gradients I'll talk about, and then just evaluating the energy. And everything's sparse. So, in 20 iterates, I'm pretty close to the true answer already. And by 40 iterates, I'm there. And I'm only doing sparse work. It's monotonic. I, um, to be fact, I didn't show this, but starting around iterate 20, I actually start skipping the localization step. What happens is that I have a little heuristic or monitor that says if the area outside of the support is already sufficiently small, just truncate it. Because what happens is that G matrix can become unstable. If you try to localize stuff when it's already zero outside the localization region, when you compute G, it's going to be infinity, where you compute the solution to this. So localization is actually, I didn't show this because it's hard to get this data out, but so only the first maybe 20 iterations, localization is really important. And I do skip the localization step. It was already sufficiently localized. But now let's look at the charge density. So let's explain this graph. This is the charge density. So this is the row, so the dag of x times that inverse matrix times x star. And I picked out the, uh, where the magic's happening, where the stuff's really happening. So the top graph is the charge density that I compute, and the upside down graph is the charge density that's computed by the SCF solution. So the question is, I mirror them so you can see, well, what I want to do is do I match support regions? How close is it to the true answer? And actually, it's actually pretty good. So I, for the large charge, where it really is a lot of charge, a high probability of finding the electrons, I match up quite well. So I actually do nail the major components of the charge density, which is all I asked for. I mean, again, I wasn't trying to solve the problem here. I'm just trying to get a good say, well, does this method really work to begin with? So I mean, it's, I missed the energy by a little bit. But the gain here is I'm scaling theoretically much better than practice we'll talk about. And you know, I'm getting the charge density pretty well. Like I nailed the, the major pink exactly. Like the actual value is exactly what it should be to you know, five or six digits. And the smaller, but important ones, I at least got the support right. So it's a great first step. And again, I chose them from a random starting point and an arbitrary localization region. But now we really get into the meat of the matter. There's all these implementation issues I haven't talked about yet. The algorithm is very simple to understand. Take a step, localize that step, and then define the sparse region. OK, scale and conditioning. E of x, g equals E of x. This is like the one equation that goes through everything in my work. What happens if I chose G to be the diagonal of, it's a diagonal matrix with scalars across? Um, what, that, what does this mean? Every column of X could have drastically different scale and it doesn't affect the norm of the subjective at all. Some columns of X might be on the order of tenths. 
some columns of x might be in the magnitude of millions. I have nothing I can do about it. Just the problem, that's just how it has to be. So one could ask, can we just normalize the columns, add a chain rule, e of x over the columns, every column x normed, so that everything is norm 1. We could, and I did this, but now think of how that affects the gradient. That has a whole new chain rule to the gradient. It's a very, very expensive to compute chain rule. You have to really, it's a big matrix. You have to go through everything column by column, compute a lot of norms. It's really messy. It is really slow. So yes, you can normalize the columns. You could get rid of the scaling issue, but it's a trade of efficiency. And so far I've noticed is that it's not that big of a deal. So yes, it's, you have some columns are different, but you know what? On the whole grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal. But it is a very important issue, especially when you start scaling the larger and larger columns, is that you're doing a line search. You're doing, you're doing a line search of a matrix, a matrix X plus alpha times a plus a matrix P. If one column is really big of the search direction P and one column is very small, you might get an arbitrarily small step length to satisfy the Wolf conditions you need. And so sometimes that one column being very big could affect the step length algorithm very severely. And we really don't want to be evaluating the energy that many times because it's just expensive, very expensive. So right now, I'm not doing anything about it. I'm just letting things become unscaled. In the future, though, we might have to every now and then, not always, it's too expensive, but every now and then, do an extra chain rule, renormalize the columns of x, and resolve the problem. Okay. So now, this is actually the most important part. I'm going to spend a few minutes here. I've said that, well, localization does not preserve descent. It doesn't. I can give examples of breaks. So how does it work again? We solve this problem. And then we take the solution of this term right here, we subtract away the initial with the sparse iterate. That's the search direction we take. So G is invertible. And I say we saw this, but you say, well, look, G has columns of sum to one. We solve G column by column, and it's a linear least squares problem. Okay, so to maintain descent, we must have the following situation: the gradient, and the search direction has to be negative. And if this were a vector, this would be gradient E transpose the vector P. This is equivalent in matrix terms. So let's start up simplifying this. Well, we can do some math. We have a really weird property here that the gradient and the previous iterate, x, is actually the orthogonal. It just turns out to be that case. It's a simple computation. So what we really need to maintain is that the gradient of E with x tilde P, PKG, is less than 0. Now let's look at this. Now let's just talk about this. Let's look at it. This way we could solve this problem here. Minimize g such that g is invertible and this trace is less than 0. If I could do this, this would be guaranteed descent every step. Okay? So let's look, actually look at it. So the Frobenius norm of g, so this is actually a quadratic term. There's a g, g transpose in there. Um, g is invertible. Well, we'll just take the column sum to 1, so it's linear in the columns of g. And this is linear in the columns of g. This is actually linear in G, the trace term is here. This is a quadratic program. It's a quadratic program in a matrix, but it's still a quadratic program. We understand them. So I wrote some code to see clearly we can't ever hope to solve this exactly. It's just the localization step we, right now is already taking k squared. So I thought maybe what happens if I try to solve it approximately? Um, it turns out that if you want localization to work, you have to solve this problem exactly. I'd hope, you know, like these truncated Newton ideas that you're far away, just get me close to the solution, point me hopefully in the right direction, that's enough. It turns out that just fails miserably. To solve this problem with this type of approach, you have to solve the localization problem exactly. Um, so I'm not doing it that way. Right now, here's how it works again. I compute the step length, the step search direction. I see if it's a descent direction. I'll give you a graph of how often it is in a minute. Is it descent? If it's not descent, I just take a truncated search direction. I don't localize, I just truncate the search direction. And I have a little check to make sure that might not be maintained in the descent direction. But I've never, that's never fired. It so happens with this problem, once you get close enough to the solution, when stuff starts failing, at least that it's, it's not as good of a search direction, you don't take as good of a step, at least it's somewhere to get descent. So we could solve this theoretically and have a perfectly valid descent algorithm 
that always generates descent directions. But this is just too expensive and these problems are so large. I, just, I can't take the time to do it. And now this is really the main issue now. This is where the linear algebra comes in and this is where I'm really working on right now. The gradients. The gradients are nasty. They're matrices. X is a matrix. The gradient's the matrix. So here's this um, full problem again. And I'll, I gave you a couple examples. Um, these aren't the exact gradients. I got rid of constants and things that were confusing. But this is the main matrix products of the gradient. Okay, so here's the gradient. So first look at S. S is a very small matrix, small square matrix, this number of electrons by number of electrons. But it's just pervasive, multiplying, applying this S inverse matrix. So we have L plus V, X inverse, X star, L plus V, all these things all over. The real bottleneck actually is this hard tree energy. It's the second term right here. It's this X inverse, X star, diag. So we're applying this S inverse matrix over and over again. And this is a major bottleneck. In fact, I, um, for some profiling, I took my code from running in 120 seconds per energy evaluation. So I had to evaluate things like this hard tree energy about four times. Because this gradient of the um, exchange correlation has three terms that look similar to this. Okay? So I t visual profiling without doing anything smart. I'm not taking advantage of sparsity yet. It is a sparse matrix. I'm not exploiting that yet because it's MATLAB. And I don't really care about wasting time on that. But I do want to get this implemented efficiently. I've taken this from 120 seconds per function evaluation. I got it in about 20. But it's still very slow. And this, these functions here are the bottleneck. But I think there's something we can do here. This is the overlap. This is S. So this is X star X. Let's look at it. So this is, I think, from a, not a random, I don't remember what problem this is, but there's 10 electrons. And they're pretty equispaced. These are the norms of the elements of S plotted as a matrix. So 2, 2 is the norm of the element at the second entry of S. So this is Sij. So this is Ij versus Sij. So let's look how downy dominant it is. In fact, the S matrix only has, in this case, I think there's overlap three, three non-zeros per column. Let's look at S inverse. S inverse is actually also diagonally dominant. The elements off the diagonal are actually rather small. They're 10 to the negative third. There's been a lot of recent work about how to invert matrices like these iteratively quickly. And these are really things we can exploit here. Because I said, when I said locality, nearby things, and nearby things, and for insulators, they decay exponentially. S here is actually showing exponential decay away from the diagonal. And now this is what I hope to exploit to solve this problem, to compute these gradients efficiently. Because even here, I said it's very big at the um, diagonal and near the diagonal, but then it gets very small away from it. And there's a little artifact at the end, of course. So maybe we can write linear algebra that solves iteratively, and we can somehow either the naive way just to try just compute the um, inverse at these components here and just pretend everything else is zero, or find an iterative approach to solve this. And there are no methods for doing this. Um, there's truncated new divergence for solving this. And it's not clear which one's going to work the best yet. But it is possible to surmount this bottleneck, I think. Um, and the final thing is where we want to go to next. So I integrate this with BFGS, because this is a totally different type of search direction. And this is, again, um, a small problem, CG versus BFGS. And what you see here, uh, this is the um, energy minus the solution, a log plot. And this number here is the number of bad search directions. Number of times that my method lost descent. And I had to do something different. So CG never lost descent. I don't, can't prove it's true, but it's conjugate gradients just kind of plugging away and always preserve the center of the matrix, or of the search direction. BFGS lost it 7 out of 10, 90 times. To be honest, I'm okay with that. Because it converged so quickly that it's okay. And again, this is from a random starting point. And for real problems, I've run this a couple times, I don't have the grasp for it yet. This model problem is actually a little harder than the real problems I've seen. Because I force the non-local terms that exchange ex energy exchange them to be very non-trivial in the model problem. Whereas in the real problem, it's actually they're much smaller. So you can actually solve this faster. Like on the methane problem, I got the solution in 20 iterations. So the model problem tends to converge require a lot more for work. But so this is going to be hope, though, that I blindly integrated this with BFGS. And I'm working on a solution for limiting BFGS because these problems are way too large to form the full Hessian approximation. And so it does hope that, you know what, right here you clue we had a problem. We do something that was you know, almost not descent. But you know what, it worked pretty well. And this is really what we're looking for in this community. We don't have to necessarily prove that it always maintains descent because they're already okay with SCF. 
which clearly is not monotonic. I mean, you can run it for 10 iterations, it'd be the wrong solution, 11 iterations is the correct solution. And then 13th iteration could be wrong again. They're okay with this. But we give them a lot more justification about why we can trust our answer when you're done. And so, yes? Do you use the same line search? I use, I, I use my line search, exact same. Well, um, with BFGS, I, I can use a little weaker line search. Right? And so I do use a weaker line search. And that's why I really want to use them in BFGS. Because the strong wolf line search is really nasty. And BFGS can even use a weak wolf search. So the theory for BFGS says that for convergence, you only need a weak wolf search. And that's much nicer, right? You don't have to do interpolation, no zooming, it's really ch ch go. And so um, I do use a weak wolf search. Um, it converges a little slower than the strong wolf search for in my experiments, but it's fewer energy evaluations. So it all depends how you want to count. And I'm counting about number of energy evaluations. So what's next? So all this right now is based on a MATLAB package by Chelikowski, Trulier, and Saad. They basically did like the stuff, how to compute the exchange correlation energy, getting it from a human readable format to a computer readable format. I basically borrowed all that and I built my stuff into that. Um, it's open source MATLAB code, it's in real space arguing finite differences, but they're actually solving the nonlinear eigenvalue vector problem with finite differences. But honestly, it's in MATLAB. It's limited in problem size and mesh length. And I don't want to spend any more time making it go faster because honestly, you can't run in a big enough problem to even make the gains really even noticeable. So that's where I just started about two weeks ago. And I'm wearing my own um, object oriented C, C++ implementation to run on the DOE computers. And really the game is here, um, what we really want to do is exploit the sparsity pattern. If we always evaluate the energy of sparse iterate, if we can get around this gradient issue, Right now the gradient requires a dense inverse, but we can do it iteratively. We're aiming for, so the goal, the theoretical goal everyone says, the big buzzword is linear scaling. I scale linearly the number of electrons. We're being a little less ambitious. We're gonna be, hopefully we'll do linear scaling in the evaluation of the energy and the gradient. But you know that localization step, we don't mind doing a little bit of work because you know it's only k number of electrons squared. You don't multiply the worst number, which is the number of grid points. So by making sure we always sparse volume energy efficiently, we hope to give a practically linear scaling algorithm, as I called it. And I think that's it. Any questions? So I have a yeah. Question. Okay. For the for the data, the, the, the sparse uh, uh -huh. the matrix, how do you randomly generate the eyes from real experiment to by the, the physics the, to collect it from? Oh, for my, my, my initial points? Yeah, the, all the matrix. Oh, right? I did it's nothing. I don't. I actually didn't want to cheat at all. I thought that any, using any physical knowledge to choose the initial guess would be cheating. Because it's like, oh, I, I always converge to the right answer if you give me a good starting guess. Yeah. I just actually called RAND. I took a random matrix. And then, for that, I, I, my hope is that, my thought is that if a random matrix converges to the right solution over and over again, then a good matrix will converge even faster. So all I do is I call RAND, and then I localize that to make sure it's sparse. Okay. Um, so again, you have really good initial guesses for these problems. And often when you see code, it's sometimes cheating because oh, we converge in seven iterations, but there's seven iterations from a point which is, you know, already looks about the same. So I'm doing random initial guesses and just sh hoping that that's, you know, I think that's a better test of the algorithm. Okay, the second one yeah. relates to the, the, the data, right? right. Uh, so then you, at the beginning, you also show there are two solutions. Like right. One is an off-cycle solution, one is a localized right. solution, uh -huh. right? So that means you may have multiple optimal solutions, oh, right? Exactly. There's, no, there's not multiple. It's even worse. Okay. Given an optimal solution, x, x times g for any invertible g is the same solution. There's uncountable number of optimal solutions. OK, so then we apply a lot of yeah. those um, right. uh, simply find right. the ways uh -huh. that truncate. Right. So does the optimal solution still automatically yeah. still preserve the way mathematically you prove yeah. it? Because you can prove that. I mean, it's just it's preserved the exact same. You get the exact same convergence proofs if you assume this maintains descent, which is a big assumption. It doesn't, but you get the same proofs as conjugate gradients. You get you can get a you know the gradient small, um, but the issue is that also it's it's one, yeah you get, there's only local, local results. Right? I do want to point out that global, yeah, yeah there's no, you can't have global results on these nonlinear problems. I mean. At least, I don't, it's, so, it's very ill conditioned from the sense there are so many local minima which are all equally valid. And all we can hope is that it's the white matches experiment. So I can't make any global proofs, nothing. But I do want to say that although I deal with this X matrix, again, 
this X matrix is physically meaningless. All that matters is rho, the charge density. I can choose X to be anything as long as that span is about the same as a different X. So in my mind, there really is no difference between the orthogonal solution and the sparse solution because the rho is the same. Right? If the rows are the same, then I can drive all the properties I want, all the forces, all the magnetic properties, everything I need. And so that's really what this is exploiting is that people are scared of non-orthogonality and we're saying if you want sparsity, you want ability to scale, you have to embrace this non-orthogonality and then just really use it over and over again. And what you lose is that you lose this gradient. The gradients are much more complicated. And I don't know why, but that was just, it took a long time for people to want to do it this way. Okay, questions? Problems they can't solve. Um, so problems they can't solve is problems they can't solve fast enough. So that there's a lot of problems people want to solve, and groups at Berkeley Labs say we're going to solve bigger problems and bigger problems. And there's nothing worse than if you go onto a supercomputer, you run SCF for a week, and you don't know if you can fully trust this answer. At least here I can say, well, here's the answer I got. Here's the gradient. Is it sufficiently small? So there is a notion of you have a convergence. You can at least give some trust to the answer. Um, in fact, um, often the gradients you get, like if you actually look at the gradient, so you take the solution of SCF and look at the gradient at that point, it's not as small as you would think it would be. Like there, it's much, it might be consistent to like five or six decimal points, but the gradient might be you know maybe a tenth or a hundredth. But that's still good enough. Because I mean, this, I think the real idea is that you can do experiments on the computer. But really, say you have 100 different problems you want to solve for the same set of atoms. You, don't, you want to like, limit it down to maybe 10 you want to go experiment in the lab. Because building stuff in the lab is really complicated. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes money, it takes hardware. So here's, here's like this best 10 to try. And that's where I sort of view this, these ideas, is to limit the things I have to do in the lab. And so I said, really right now working on solving some real problems and it's writing something that scales on massively comp massive computers. Anyway, thank you very much.